welcome back to Well That's Interesting. The, I don't know how these are related, but I also kind of do, edition. Today is <laughs> episode 210, why and how mosquitoes are delivered through the mail, and how many hell holes are there on earth? My friends, <laughs> not to brag, but I have a special talent. No matter where I am in the world, on land or at sea, I'll find myself with a brand new mosquito bite. From the depths of New York City's transit system to the heights of the Norwegian Arctic, I've had the honor of being bitten, while my partner and even my siblings are left completely ignored. As to why, well, maybe you've heard this one too. It's blood type that attracts mosquitoes. However, it turns out, according to Leslie Vosshall, a neurobiologist and mosquito expert at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and the Rockefeller University, that's not entirely the case. Leslie told Daniel Leonard of Scientific American, quote, evidence is weak for this link. In sum, us humans are still trying to figure out why some of us are like sugar to mosquitoes. In a recent study from 2022, Leslie and Maria Elna de Abadia, nailed it, a senior scientist at the biotech company Kingdom, <laughs> Kingdom Supercultures, they performed an experiment with 64 participants, asking them to wear nylon stockings on their arms. And stick with me here. After six hours, the nylons were drenched with each person's unique smell. Researchers then cut the nylons into pieces and placed two pieces from different participants into a closed container housing female mosquitoes. Long story short, one participant had an attractiveness score, quote, over 100 times greater than that of the least attractive subjects. Uh, that was 19 and 28, by the way, end quote. The study authors wrote. Um, now, we're not talking about Riz. We're talking about carboxylic acids. Leslie and Maria found that the most attractive subjects tended to produce greater levels of carbo carboxylic acids from their skin, while the least attractive subjects produced less. Now, what the fuck are carboxylic acids, you may be asking? Well, I did too. I've got you. And you might want to sit down for this. We humans naturally produce oils from our skin called sebum and the bacteria living on our bodies. Well, they eat this sebum and the end result is this carboxylic acid. So yes, we're essentially being pooped on, but without this relationship, our skin would be kind of useless. These acids help protect and moisturize us. And here's another fun fact. Carboxylic acids are divided into six categories based on size and function. And those with five to 10 carbon atoms have what's been described as having a um, goaty odor like that that can be found in cheese. So in a way, I may smell like expensive cheese to mosquitoes, but I've been called worse, so it's fine. And here's some more good news. You don't have to smell like cheese to be bit. Oh, no, no, no. If you're human, that's all it takes for a mosquito to be interested. And that can be dangerous. According to the World Health Organization, malaria, a parasitic infection transmitted by mosquitoes, this causes an estimated 219 million cases globally and results in more than 400,000 deaths every year. And most of the deaths occur in children under the age of five. Dengue is the most prevalent viral infection transmitted by mosquitoes. More than 3.9 billion people in over 129 countries are at risk, with an estimated 96 million symptomatic cases and an estimated 40,000 deaths every year. But here's some real good news, like for real. With preventative measures, we can reduce these numbers. In the first half of the show, we're going to talk about SIT, or the sterile insect technique. My friends, researchers have found out that if you release sterile male mosquitoes into the wild, females lay more barren eggs, 
thus reducing the number of mosquitoes. So, how do we get those males out there? Well, scientists from New Mexico State University came up with some spectacular results. We're going to get into the study that literally crammed thousands of mosquitoes into the tiniest of packages. We're going to figure out how to sterilize them and discover what environment it takes to successfully send these insects through the mail to be released and save lives. Then after the break, a mosquito bite may feel like hell, but uh, there are actual places on Earth that kind of feel like it too. And uh, remember back in the monumental milestone of episode 200, we talked about a category of holes that we never covered before? Yeah, we talked about a brand new category of holes. I was so excited. In that episode, we learned that our oceans are filled with what's called blue holes. And if you haven't had a listen, you should. It was a good time. Well, I've got another new category, and again, I'm damn excited. We're going to talk about hell holes. And it's right in time for spooky season. I've got four hell holes for you, located in four different areas of our little world, and we're going to dive right the fuck in. Now, what makes them a hell hole, you may be asking? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm not going to give it away here, but I can tell you, there will be fire, toxic gases, cows, volcanoes, and human error involved. In the meantime, hi, I'm Jill Chacha, and if this is your first time listening, welcome to the flock, my infinite business goose. To begin, let's get acquainted with the star of this portion of the show, the mosquito. What do you say? Well, I'm sorry, we're gonna do it anyway. Now, although the average mosquito weighs about 2.5 milligrams, or about two thousandths of a gram, I mean, basically nothing, collectively, there's over 3,500 species of mosquito on Earth. They've been around since the Triassic period, around 400 million years ago, and have been in North America since the Cretaceous period, 100 million years ago. They use sight, infrared radiation, and chemical signals to find hosts. And get this, they can detect movement, that infrared radiation from warm bodies and chemicals, like carbon dioxide and the acids we spoke about from the top of the show, they could detect all of that up to 35 meters away, which is a mind-boggling 115 feet. So yes, they can smell you up to 115 feet away. And that is genuinely horrifying. And there's more. Only female mosquitoes bite humans and animals, and they only drink blood for reproduction. Which means they need about three times their body weight in blood during a feeding. Now, although only a small number of species carry disease-causing pathogens, and the amount of blood that they can take from you is a mere five millionths of a liter, this has added up over time. My friends, seriously, if you combined the fatalities of every war ever fought, and every human fatality caused by a fellow human, machine, or another animal, that number, that number would still be lower, far lower, than the number of deaths caused by mosquitoes. According to historian Timothy Weingard, mosquitoes have killed nearly half of all humans who have ever lived, or 52 billion people. I will say that again. They have killed nearly half of all humans who have ever lived, and that's 52 billion people, and they did it over the course of a mere 200,000 years. (laughs) This accomplishment has crowned the mosquito, quote, the world's deadliest animal, and that title was given by the CDC. So, (laughs) what are we going to do about it? (laughs) How do we defend ourselves against such an ancient and accurate army? This question has been asked for a very long time, and a number of inventions and suggestions and theories have been brought to to the proverbial table, including 
the use of x-rays. My friends, when Wilhelm Röntgen, a physics professor in Würzburg, Bavaria, accidentally discovered x-rays on November 8th, 1895, the world was set ablaze with ideas. Now, this sounds crazy even today, but by the early 1900s, scientists of the time were like, oh my god, we could probably use these rays to sterilize pests. But it being the early 1900s, the technological effort and the scale of coordination needed to do so, well, it wasn't quite there. By the 1950s, however, entomologists Raymond Bushland and Edward Kipling, well, they were ready to throw their dapper hats into the ring. They were the first to try a little something called the sterile insect technique, or SIT for short. And the first pest that they attempted to mess with and fiddle around with their reproductive cycle, this was the appropriately named screwworm fly. And I swear to God, you can't make this up. Why the screwworm fly? Well, that is a great question. Uh, one, screwworms prey on warm-blooded animals, but especially, especially cattle. And if Americans love anything, y'all, it's beef. Beef has been so ingrained into the identity of being an American, you can say that it goes just as deep as the larva of these flies who are placed in open wounds. Once they hatch, they then proceed to eat into the animal, and they do so with such a veracity they can inf <sighs> infected cattle, let's just say they can die within 10 days. Just 10. In the 1950s, screwworms caused annual losses to the American meat and dairy industry that were projected at above $200 million, y'all. And if that sounds like a lot, holy shit, it was and it is. That's about $2.5 billion in today's dollars. But Raymond and Edward, they saw a silver lining. Female screwworms mate only once, only once in their life. And if that mating happened with a sterile male, well, she's not laying any viable eggs. In 1954, the duo radiated and released enough males they successfully eradicated the entire population of screwworms from a 176 square mile island named Curacao off the coast of Venezuela. Dude, the screwworms were gone in like seven weeks. Seven weeks! This saved the domestic goat herds that were there as a source of meat and milk. They brought this methodology and success to North America, where eventually it led to the screwworm being completely eradicated from Southern United States, Mexico, and eventually all of Central America. Yeah, round of applause. No, you're right, you're out, you can clap. It's not often you hear about such a story one where pests are removed without destroying or hurting the surrounding environment or other species. SIT was and really is a game changer. And if you're wondering how it all works exactly, and if we are using it now against disease-carrying mosquitoes, those are great questions. Let's get into it. My airborne business goose, it's time. Drop whatever it is you're holding, uh, ignore the shatter, it's alright, and pick up your phone. Yes, thank you. Head on over to uh, head on over to today's posts on our social media stuffs, and you shall see a diagram of the SIT process, as provided by ocvector.org. Now, if you're too busy eradicating a pest yourself, don't worry, I could sum up the diagram for you. Um, according to the Orange County Mosquito and Vector Control District, you know the one, Quote, large numbers of mosquitoes are raised in a lab. Male mosquito pupa are separated from the female pupa, where the males are radiated using ionizing radiation to make them sterile. Males are then regularly released to mate with wild females. The resulting eggs will not hatch. End quote. Done and done. All right, we could all go home, right? No. No. <laughs> This is actually way harder than it seems. My friends, compared to the cattle-loving screwworm 
Mosquitoes are a logistical nightmare. There are a number of factors that need to be considered for this to actually make an impact. For example, researchers need to assess the damage inflicted upon and the death toll of males during transport from the rearing facility to the release site and during the actual release in the field. So the package that they're in, the temperature of that package, the total number of male mosquitoes in that package all affect the outcome. And um, there's also one other not so small problem. <laughs> Quote, male mosquitoes are really lazy. They don't like to fly much. Senior researcher Emo Henson, sorry, Emo Hansen from New Mexico State University, uh, uh, the research Emo told Gizmodo, continuing the quote, over a lifetime, they'll fly up to 100 meters, 200 meters, but not more, end quote. <laughs> so, on top of creating the perfect container for transit, Researchers need to get these lazy-ass males as close to the females as possible, which means that the container also has to be a manageable size for drones. Yeah, drones. To literally Uber them to the ladies. So how do you go about testing something like this? I mean, it seems like a pain in the ass. Well, thankfully, Emo and his team we're on it. They reared two to 5,000 mosquitoes for experiments that tested a variety of temperatures, how tightly they could pack mosquitoes into various syringe sizes without inflicting damage, and then leveled up by shipping thousands of males from New Mexico to their colleagues over at the University of California, Davis. So, after all the clickety-clack calculations were made, after all the stuffing there was to be stuffed, and after checking in on how the males fared during transit and release, what did they discover? Drumroll, please. Thank you in the back. First, let's chat about temperatures. I know, fun. Um, everywhere from 7 to 28 degrees Celsius or 45 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit, we're given a go. And it turns out the sweet spot is 57 degrees Fahrenheit or 14 degrees Celsius for no more than 24 hours. So you've got 24 hours under these conditions to get them where they got to go. And that's fun. <laughs> but what is really fun was um, a section of the study called Compaction Effects Mosquito Survival During Incubator Storage. Sounds dry, but holy shit, you need to listen to this. My friends, brace yourselves. Male mosquitoes were compacted into a space as small as one cubic centimeter at numbers of up to 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, and then 160, and then 240 male mosquitoes, all in this one space. And the best survival rate? It was cramming the most into the smallest space. 240 mosquitoes every cubic centimeter was the best way to go. And just to understand how insane this is, that space versus the number of mosquitoes, whew, I'd like you to stand. Okay, you're already standing. Great. Walk into your kitchen and I want you to take out a teaspoon. Okay, I'll give you a sec. Okay, you got it? Are you looking at the teaspoon? Okay, this amounts to around 1,200 mosquitoes in a single teaspoon. 1,200 per one cubic centimeter. As an additional visual, that's about 2,500 in a 10 milliliter syringe or 7,200 mosquitoes packed into an ounce or a single shot glass for my party geese. That is a lot of males in a teeny space and I think I know what you're thinking. One, y'all, that's so fucking gross, no matter what the species is. And two, how is that possible? How could they survive such a squeeze? Well, Emo has an answer. He told Gizmodo, quote, we think this is because the vibrations of the plane 
damage the loosely packed mosquitoes. End quote. Think of it this way. Imagine you and seven of your best friends are in a box. And that box is being tossed about by someone who is forced to work on a Saturday. And then it's attached to a drone flying over swamps, dodging tree limbs and shit. You and your friends are going to be shook, literally and figuratively. But if you and 7,200 of your best friends are packed into that box, no one is moving, which means no injuries, maybe just a little nausea. So, this experiment was an enormous success, but the team wants to take this sterile Uber even farther by, quote, working with our physical lab here at New Mexico State, since they have vibration tables that they use to make electronics vibration-proof, end quote. Emo told Gizmodo, and I'm sure that's all they're used for. Anyway, reducing the number of vibrations of the drone itself will hopefully add to the male survival rate. And honestly, I don't know what else we can do to make this easier for them. But Emo is gonna try. After the break, unlike the male mosquito, we are gonna wrap, wrap? We are gonna rack up some miles. Please join me around the world as we peer into the most terrifying, horrifying holes around. Bring a gas mask, a Tyvek suit, and some snacks. Stay tuned. Our bodies come in different shapes and sizes, so doesn't it make sense that our weight loss plan should too? Noom builds a personal plan that factors in dietary restrictions, medical issues, and other personal needs so your plan works for you. One of the things I love about Noom is that it doesn't feel restrictive. Instead of focusing on what you can't eat, it helps you develop a healthier relationship with food. You can still enjoy your favorite treats in moderation, which makes it a sustainable approach that I can actually stick to. If you're looking for a personalized weight loss program that actually works, I highly recommend giving Noom a try. It's a program that's helped me achieve my goals and feel better than ever. Stay focused on what's important to you with Noom's psychology and biology-based approach. Sign up for your trial today at Noom.com. That's N-O-O-M.com. Go check out Noom today. If you're listening to this podcast, then we know you love learning. So let me tell you about Airwave History Plus, now available on Apple Podcasts. Airwave History Plus is your ticket to ad-free listening, bonus content, and early episodes from dozens of the most popular history podcasts, including History That Doesn't Suck, The Explorers Podcast, The History of World War II, Queen's Podcast, The History of Egypt, The Age of Napoleon, and more. For your free trial, search Airwave History Plus on Apple Podcasts and hit subscribe. That's Airwave History Plus, available now on Apple Podcasts. Airwave History Plus, the essential audio destination for history lovers. And we're back. We are so back. And my friends, I'm going to kick off our worldwide travels with a quote. Quote, This space is full of a vapor so misty and dense that one could scarcely see the ground. Any animal that passes inside meets instant death. I threw in sparrows, and they immediately breathed their last and fell. End quote, said the Greek geographer Strabo around 64 to 63 BC. Well, <laughs> this unsettling sight between the crawling mist and Avicide, this is our first stop. What the good Strabo here is talking about was actually a holy place to many. So please, join me in the ancient Phrygian city of Hierapolis, a place now called Pamukkale, a town in western Turkey. And as you could tell by the original name Hierapolis, this area dates back to a time of classical antiquity. Founded around 190 BC by a dude named Eumenes II, king of Pergamum, you know the one, Hierapolis was given over to Rome shortly thereafter in 133 BC. And a very long, bloody, tumultuous story short, today, what is now Pamukkale. To be honest, it doesn't look anything different 
than paradise, ironically. So please, stop whatever war you're raging and head on over to our social media stuff. Stop, tap on today's post and you shall see what looks like the snowy mountains of the Arctic. But no, we are nowhere near the Arctic Circle and this isn't snow. We are still in Pumukau, a place whose name aptly translates to Cotton Castle from Turkish. According to Ye Old Wiki, the area is famous for a carbonite material left behind by the flowing thermal spring water. Cotton Castle refers to its surfaces, the shimmering snow-white limestone shaped over the millennia by those calcite-rich springs. Dripping Dripping slowly down the mountainside, mineral-rich waters collect in and cascade down the mineral terraces into pools below." End quote. Damn, it goes without saying. These pools draw in tourists and locals seeking beauty and medicinal perks. And the place's age and the Roman ruins have granted it protection. Pamukkale is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, a title granted in 1988. In sum, this is a kind of heaven. Yet, for a small sect back in Strabo's time, one particular cave here, hidden within these springs, was hell, and they wouldn't have it any other way. My friends, for decades, a team led by Francesco Di Andrea, or Di Andrea, nailed it, a professor of classical archaeology at the University of Salento, Italy, well, they've been searching for what Strabo had described, a gate to hell, known as Pluto's Gate. And if you're thinking, wait, 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 wasn't it Hades who rocked the underworld? Uh, yes, you are right. When the Romans conquered Greece and absorbed most of their mythology, the name Pluto replaced Hades. And if you want to get fancy, because why not? What's called a Plutonian in Greek or a Plutonium in Latin, this cave was celebrated as the portal to the underworld in the Greco-Roman mythology and tradition. So why, you may be asking? Great question. It was told that worshippers of Pluto and the eunuchs of Sibyl, an ancient fertility goddess, would enter near the mouth of this cave with bulls in tow. Quote, spectators could watch as the large animals started to struggle before they dropped dead, all while the priests remained unharmed, end quote, said Francesca Barron of iflscience.com. So, yes, just with any good Roman-era event, it was a show. Anyone could come and sit in the small, elevated amphitheater, a safe distance from the cave, to watch these chosen few sacrifice animals and then walk away unscathed and alive. To prove their god's power even further, onlookers like Strabo would be handed birds, who upon their release would be attracted to the warmth of the cave's mouth where they would die. So, how did these followers survive? Well, easy, kinda. <laughs> Quote, they hold their breath as much as they can, Strabo wrote, adding that their immunity could also have been due to their divine providence, or certain physical powers and antidotes against the vapor. End quote. Now, I can see your expression. <laughs> I think you're thinking holding your breath is kind of lame and a parlor trick. But y'all, these folks were dedicated they spent 24-7 by the cave using whatever techniques they could to be close to their god. Sometimes with truly groovy side effects. Quote, Pilgrims took to the waters in the pool near the temple, slept not too far from the cave, and received visions and prophecies in a sort of Oracle of Delphi effect. Indeed, the fumes coming from the depths of Hierapolis' phoretic groundwater produced hallucinations. End quote from Rosella Lorenzi of NBC News. My friends, I ask, knowing this, how could you not want to find a place like this? For DeAndrea, it was his white whale. 
until a eureka moment in 2013. D'Andrea told NBC News, we found the plutonium by reconstructing the route of a thermal spring. Indeed, all of Pamukkale's springs, all of them which produce the famous white terraces, they originate from this one cave. We also found the remains of a temple, a pool, and a series of steps placed above the cave, all matching the descriptions of the site in ancient sources." End quote. So yeah, my submerged business goose, by backtracking and following the multitude of springs flowing within Pumakale, the team found a single source, and it happened to be the gate to hell. And to truly seal the deal that this was for sure Pluto's gate, countless bird remains were uncovered here. And yes, today, the place itself is filled with gases that creep into the space from a fissure. Recent research, recent research indicates that the gas is, drumroll please, thank you in the back, volcanic carbon dioxide or CO2, which explains the smothering and hallucinations. As to why the gate and its surroundings, well, why they've been hidden for so many centuries, well, during the 6th century AD, the plutonium was initially destroyed by Christians, and the remains were then covered over by countless earthquakes. But thanks to Strabo and Deandria, we now know that all roads lead to hell. Well, that was fun. Let's uh, continue, shall we? Fantastic. Let's pack our bags and fly south to Nokuru County, Kenya. And for my fellow geographically challenged Americans who are stoked to peer into another hole but have no idea where this is, don't worry. I've got you. Please imagine. Africa. Thank you. Point to the very center. Okay, there is the Democratic Republic of Congo. And if you move your finger a smidge to the right, there you have Uganda. Now, move it one more time. Perfect. Here we are. Kenya. And in the lower left corner is Nakuru County, whose logo tells you everything you want to know about this remarkable place. I have a screenshot of it over at our social media stuffs, but if you're too busy making a hellhole of your own, I can describe it for you. At the center, there's the county motto, quote, a county of unlimited opportunity, end quote. And above it are two flamingos who are flanking what looks to be a volcano. And yes, sure enough, Nakuru County is situated between Lake Naivasha and not one, but two volcanoes, the Longonats and the Saswa volcanoes. And because of this, Nakuru County is flush with life and a national park that's called, you guessed it, Hell's Gate National Park. And for a mere $26, we can visit hell. But don't worry, the tickets are on me. And I gotta say, hell is gorgeous. <laughs> as, des as described by the park's website, kws.go.ke, named for the intense geothermal activity within its boundaries, the Hell's Gate National Park is a remarkable quarter of the Great Rift Valley. Spectacular scenery, including the towering cliffs, water-gouged gorges, stark rock towers, scrub-clad volcanoes, and belching plumes of geothermal steam make it one of the most atmospheric parks in Africa. Hell's Gate is an ideal venue for a day trip from Nairobi, where, in addition to the biodiversity that includes raptors, <laughs> visitors can enjoy mountain biking, rock climbing, and a natural spa, end quote. So yes, my innocent business goose, Hell has belching plumes and raptors, as one expects, uh, and a spa. But it also has a little something called the Oi Joroa Gorge. A deep, long hole after which the park gets its name. The gorge itself was formed after millions of years of volcanic processes and tectonic activity. Water erosion smoothed its seemingly endless curves and valleys. Y'all, its magnificence is seductive. 
but travelers need to be oh so cautious. Not only are not only are its geysers and hot springs still active, but the slightest rain can kill. In 2012, seven members of a church group were killed by a flash flood. In 2019, another flash flood killed six. According to showcaves.com, at certain points there are emergency exits. These are knotted ropes where it's possible to climb out of the gorge. It's obviously better to avoid such situations by checking the weather forecast before you go, and that's another reason for a guided tour. The guides know when the danger is too high and to cancel the trip. End quote. Y'all, the site really stresses having a guide. <laughs> Like over and over. And that's mostly because they know where to avoid these following spots within Oya Jaroa. What's called the Devil's Mouth, the Point of No Return, and simply Hell. And if you're dying to know more, so did I, so I gave him a Google. The Devil's Mouth is one of the narrowest spots of the gorge, and yes, it looks like a mouth. The Point of No Return really means it. It's such a, a steep hill that there's no way back up. If you decide to climb down, you're committed. You have to go all the way to the end. And hell, as no surprise, is the most difficult part of the gorge. It's a hike and climb for experts. Don't even ask about trying. Oh shit, I almost forgot about the devil's bathroom. Yes, it's here, and it's not at your ex's or the last club you found yourself in. It's at the foot of a particular steep drop within the gorge, where you'll find two springs which also happen to hang off a cliff. This forms two waterfalls. One is incredibly cold, and the other is incredibly hot. So it's the kind of bidet you'd find in hell. I fucking love this place. I really do. But we need to continue on with our fiery journey around the world. And we will do so by giving a shout out to probably one of the most famous hell holes known to man. And one caused by man. The Darvazas Crater in Turkmenistan. Just a wee 37 hours if you drive east of Turkey. My friends, back in the coldest of wars, 1971, the Soviets were doing what they did best, looking for oil fields in the Karakum Desert of Turkmenistan. Although their experts were sure that they found millions of gallons, uh, they did, in a way, but it wasn't oil. They had actually tapped into something more unstable, if you will. The Soviets had come across an enormous pocket of natural gas. As such, the hollow ground underneath the extraordinarily heavy oil rig collapsed forming, you guessed it, a giant hole. Now, how giant was it? I'm glad you asked. 70 meters, or 230 feet across, and about 20 meters, or 66 feet deep. And, oh, come on, I can, I can see your expression from here. It says, it says, Jill, we covered a lot of holes on this show, like a lot. That's actually small in comparison to the holes of Chetumal Bay, which we learned about back in episode 200. You are absolutely right, my dear business goose. It is. But those holes at Chetumal Bay aren't perpetually on fire like this one. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Where are we? Oh yes, the hole had just been formed, thanks to the spot's instability, which, as it turns out, was contagious. This hole led to a series of collapses and smaller holes, bespeckled, bespeckling the region uh, with the battered ground just falling in on itself, one after the other. Now, this is very much a disaster. But I have good news. It got worse, exponentially. Researchers had detected methane spewing from every collapsed hole. And just a reminder about methane. It's a flammable gas, and it can reduce the amount of oxygen in the air. This can result in mood changes, slurred speech, vision problems, memory loss, nausea, vomiting, and headaches. So, to avoid putting the surrounding lives at risk, 
the government decided to do what any government would do in such a situation. They set the holes on fire. It was believed the methane would run out. Eventually. But my friends, it's 2024, and the Darvaza crater continues to be a hellish beacon of light. There is no estimate as to when it will go out on its own, and honestly, any human intervention may just make things more explodey. For example, any digging into the ground could create new paths for the gas to escape, allowing the fire to start again. So, as explained by the humorously named fire scientist Guillermo Rain at Imperial College London, any attempt to extinguish the flames could be dangerous and likely increase the risk of an explosion. Hmm. As we let that sink in, let us travel to our final destination, where, coincidentally, we will bear witness to one of the most dramatic effects of climate change. The sinking of Batagaika. Ooh, let's try that again. Y'all, this has, this has been a linguistic journey for me. <laughs> And I'm sure I nailed every word. Let's try that one again. The sinking of the Batagaika Crater, located in the Sakha Republic of Russia. Now, where in the holy hell is this and what is this? Don't worry, I've got you. Imagine Russia. Wonderful. Point to its very northeast corner, like the very northeast, all the way up there in the corner, and make a gigantic circle. Okay, bigger. Perfect. This is Saka, the largest republic of Russia, and it has a large problem. A section of it is currently experiencing a mega slump. Mm -hmm. Say it with me now. Mega slump. And although this is the best possible name for a death metal band and my depression, it's actually a phenomenally... <laughs> it's actually a phenomenally long gash in the landscape. It's a massive frown, 328 feet deep, around a kilometer or half a mile long, and it began forming in the 1960s when the permafrost here began warming and sinking. Ever since, it's been deepening 33 to 98 feet per year. 98 feet per year. And to be honest, I gotta say, my words aren't doing it justice. So please, everyone, Ignore the world around you, and head on over to the Tube of You. That's right, y'all. The Tube of You. We're going to search. The world's biggest permafrost crater is growing. I'm typing that in right now. Again, that's the world's biggest permafrost crater. Permafrost crater is growing, and a YouTube, YouTube video from Reuters will pop up. Uh, I'll have some screenshots of this video on our socials if you can't watch along. But if you can, it will definitely help. Like, just, it'll tell you, it'll show you just how massive this gash is. Okay, so, here we go. The world's biggest permafrost crater is growing, a video by Reuters. Let's learn about how this crater sinking is a sign of our eventual doom. This is the world's biggest permafrost crater, a gash in the earth of Russia's far east, stretching two-thirds of a mile. And as the planet warms up, the Batagaika crater's permafrost is melting. Locals call it the cave-in, or the gateway to the underworld. But it has a scientific name too, a mega slump. Scientists warn the phenomenon is a sign of danger for what's to come. The crater began to appear in the 1960s as a result of deforestation in the area. The deforestation led to the loss of ground ice, which then caused the earth to begin eroding. Since then, locals have taken note of its rapid growth. I could translate for you. I know I don't speak Russian, but I do read captions. And it says two years ago, the edge was about 20 to 30 meters away from this path. And now apparently it's much closer. Usually on that side, it expands about 10 meters, 
стороны где-то метров 10 уходит. С той стороны где-то метров 4-6. Вот так, каждый год. Ну, и от года по-разному. Scientists aren't sure exactly how fast the crater will expand, but they say Russia is warming at least 2.5 times faster than the rest of the world, melting the long frozen tundra that covers about 65% of the country's land and releasing greenhouse gases stored in the soil. Researcher Nikita Tananayev says that will further fuel global warming. It is a sign of danger because this is produced by uh, higher air temperatures, by warming climate, by anthropogenic impact. So we would say that, yeah, uh, toward the future, with increasing temperatures, with higher anthropogenic pressure, we will see more and more of those mega slumps forming. Up until all the permafrost will be gone, well, which is an extreme case, but I have to, to pronounce it nonetheless. Thawing permafrost has already threatened cities and towns across northern and northeastern Russia, buckling roadways, splitting apart houses, and disrupting pipelines. All right, there you go. Yay, yay. Um, a section of Russia is sinking, and most of us are going to be underwater soon. Which means... I'll have more hellholes to report on. At least, at least we'll be having fun. And thank you for listening, waiting, telling your friends about how and why mosquitoes are being delivered through the mail. Or just tell them that they are delivered through the mail and don't follow up on that. Tell them about all the hellholes we talked about today. The one in, uh, the one in Kenya. It's a, there's a whole park dedicated to one hole. Wouldn't you want that? <laughs> you want a whole park dedicated uh okay to a whole sorry i had to say it uh and a crater sized thanks to the folks over at airwave media the podcast network to which w type <laughs> wti belongs i'm trying to hold in my laughter uh if you love this show and you do you'll love the other podcasts in this family and please stay interesting <laughs>